Hey everyone, blessed feast of the Annunciation of the Most Holy Theotokos. Uh, you know, today in the, the Triparian today, we say today is the beginning of our salvation. You know, of course, we all we speak about uh, the feast of the Nativity of Christmas as the incarnation in the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, really, today he's conceived. Today he actually enters in creation. Today he is. Today on the feast of the Annunciation, he actually becomes incarnate. As I said, he ent the uncreated enters creation. And of course, we know not just as a phantasm, his body is not an illusion. It's truly man in every way. It's interesting that today the archangel Gabriel, of course, we know how he came and he hailed the mother of God. He cries, rejoice. You know, thus he's announcing the good news, of course, of, of the gospel. It's the, it's the good news of the undoing of the ancient curse. Right, the mother of the human race, Eve, is paralleled here with the mother of the Christian race, the mother of the redeemed human race, which is, of course, the mother of God, the Theotokos. Eve, after she and Adam had sinned, right? God came to them. God pronounced curses based on their because they had sinned. He's uh, God told her, "I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception." In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So this began the pain of childbirth. And this pain of childbirth is itself already a shadow. It's a sign of the death that now lurks behind every conception. Right? Because we sinned, we fell, we now are condemned to death. So every new child, we already know, uh, that that child is going to die. Behind every conception, there is already lurking this sense of death because of this curse, because of sin, because of death. This is the lot of every man who is conceived in iniquities, as uh, the prophet David says. Behold, I was conceived in iniquities. Uh, we're all touched by ancestral sin. Um, so now... It, it's interesting. On the one hand, we might say, "Okay, why does the why does the angel's greeting rejoice? What does that have to do with undoing, you know, the curse that was uh, pronounced to Eve?" Of course, we could say, despite the fact that childbirth is painful, and despite the fact that we know our child will eventually die, nonetheless, obviously, childbearing, giving birth, is a joyous thing. So we could say it's not that interesting that the archangel Gabriel cries rejoice that when he has this news that she's going to conceive but we have to think about the fact that of course nothing in scripture is just accidental uh the, you know the archangel gabriel hails her in this way it's not an accident it's it's specific uh and the fathers do connect these two things think about god came to them to adam and eve in the garden and just as he had spoken creation into existence, he now speaks these curses. Whereas here, it's although it's the archangel Gabriel who's hailing, the blessing itself, the cause of the rejoicing itself, is the word of God, the incarnate word of God. These things are clearly paralleled. Uh, the, and as I said, the fathers do speak to this, that this cry of rejoice is to be understood as the enunciation of the undoing of the ancient curse. Whereas before it was like, get ready for sorrow, now it's rejoice. Um, <clears throat> as I said, um, for Eve and everyone who living after her, uh, conception is already, it bear, does bear that sorrow because we already know our child is going to die. Unfortunately, uh, although we know, you know, in our Christian faith is that they will be, you know, we all will be resurrected. Now, in the words of St. Ephraim, the Syrian, he said, you know, if, if not for sin, Eve would have been preserved from the pangs Women would have been preserved from the pangs of their births, from the ignominy of having to raise them, and from wailing over their deaths. Okay, so pain and suffering, uh, every kind of corruption, really. Uh, it was unknown by man in the garden. Man was created as uh, an immortal vessel of grace, right? Man was created immortal and was meant to continue in that immortality he was sustained by grace man did not know any suffering uh the fathers are very clear on this obviously there was no death death is the result of sin but that means also that there was you know they, man didn't need to sleep man couldn't be harmed by the weather man couldn't be harmed by animals there was no kind of pain and suffering all of that is 
because of these curses, because of sin, because of death. None of that has to do with what God intended for mankind. Man was meant to live this blessed life in paradise. Think about its paradise. What kind of paradise has corruption in it? So now all of our bodily weaknesses, our infirmities, they are images. Uh, they speak to us of, they remind us of the fact that death is coming. And although death is a curse, we know it's also a blessing in some way. Even in the Old Testament, it put it, it put an end to sin. You die and you don't sin anymore. And now for us, Christ has been in the grave and came out the other side, making death now a passage to life. Nevertheless, we know that all of our bodily infirmities, these, these are, as I said, remind us of the fact that death is awaiting all of us, all of us who live outside of Eden. We've all been kicked out of Eden. Uh, literally, we don't live in the garden. We didn't turn the world into paradise. We didn't make the garden kind of spread out. And in our hearts, we lose paradise, um, which we regain through the church. Think about this. Every night in our evening prayers, we, we refer to this. We point to our beds, it says, right? We point to our breads, beds and we pray in the words of St. John Damascus, Behold, the coffin lieth before me. Behold, death confronteth me. Of course, this isn't just morbid obsession with the, oh, I'm going to die, how awful. But the remembrance of death is a good, blessed practice. It helps us to remember that we were all, we will all face God. We will stand in judgment for what we've done. Uh, if we truly remember this, uh, has not some disturbed psychological state, but as a grace filled state where God is blessing us to have this in mind. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the wisdom of Sirach, the ladder of John, of St. John's ladder of divine ascent, even says, if you acquire this remembrance of death, you'll, you won't sin anymore. If you truly remember that you're gonna, that sin you're about to commit, you're going to pay, you're going to be judged for it. You're going to stand before God. You really think about that. You're not going to commit that sin. So even in our daily, in our evening prayers, we say, behold, you know, behold the coffin. We remind ourselves. You know, and Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, you know, we're talking about conception. We're talking about uh, childbearing. They had been called to be fruitful and multiply, right? Even in paradise, before the fall, this was already a command given. But according to the fathers, this was in a manner, we don't know how it would have happened. We assume, we, we tend to assume, uh, well, we know how childbearing happens now, but this was paradise. Um, well, let's be just things are things are different in paradise. The fathers, several of the greatest fathers, St. John of Damascus, St. Maximus, St. Gregory of Nyssa, tell us that this multiplication, this childbearing would have been in a manner past understanding, foreknown to God. Um, and I believe it is a, the universal teaching of the fathers. You may find one or two who don't completely agree, but it's a, essentially it's a universal teaching of the fathers that marriage and reproduction as we know it came into existence as a re, after the fall. Now, I do want to caveat that say that doesn't mean that does not mean marriage and, and, and sexual relations are sinful in any way. That's not what it means. Because yet, although it's a post-fall reality, it's still instituted by God. God is the one who said, you know, he said, Adam and Eve, you know, cling to one another. Uh, you're going to, you know, cling to one another and bear children. Uh, this is blessed by God. Nevertheless, it is a result of the fall because it's just, we would have reproduced in another way. We, the way that we... Marriage and the marital relations that we know now are come from after the fall. Even St. John of Chrysostom, you know, he's he's hailed as the one who perhaps speaks the most highly of marriage. He still recognizes this fact. He says that after the disobedience, after their loss in the garden, then it was that the practice of intercourse had its beginning. Uh, and this just makes sense. In the garden, they lived, they didn't live according to bodily needs. There were no bodily needs because there was no death. Nothing could harm them. No bodily needs, no bodily passions. Um, this just wasn't, it wasn't according to their mode of life then. Uh, their enjoyment was God and God alone. And the sin was in beholding the fruit and understanding it simply as, sensual, as pleasure according to the senses. You know, sensual pleasure sounds worse. Uh, a pleasure according to the senses. Um, okay. So we've laid that down. Okay. So man is created in the image of God, right? So they're, Obviously, that doesn't mean our nature is. Of course, we're not divine, but there are there are, in some sense, similarities between 
we could even say the, the inner life of the triune Godhead and the life of man who is fashioned in his image. You know, this we are not going to go into depth and in what it means to be in the image of God, but it means something. It means there is some commonality, right? And we can say that the mode of life corresponds to your mode of origin. Okay, what do I mean by that? So let's think about God, the Holy Trinity. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God, right? We know that they're all God. They are three. They are equal in essence. They're consubstantial. They are equal in, they have one will, one power, one dominion, one glory, same honor. They are equal in every way. In, in a, you know, the, we believe that the Father is the monarch, but none of them is of greater value than the other. The, the persons of the Trinity are equal. They're all 100% God, not lacking anything. So how do we distinguish them as persons? The distinction between them is their mode of origin. Okay, right? Think about the creed, you know, one God, the Father Almighty, and then we speak about the Son, who is begotten in the Spirit who proceeds. So the Father alone is unoriginate. He has no source outside of himself. The Son alone is eternally begotten, and the Spirit alone eternally proceeds from the Father. That is the distinction between them. Their origin, we can say, that's what distinguishes them personally. You know, St. John of Damascus, uh, he teaches this. Not, Of course, not just St. John of Damascus, many fathers. You know, we know, think about it. He has a work called The Exact Exposition of the Orthodox Faith. He's a reliable witness. He says that Christ bears the same attributes as the Father, except for being ingenerate, right? He's he begotten. That's the difference. St. Gregory of Nyssa also says the idea of cause is what differentiates the persons of the Holy Trinity, right? One exists without a cause. Another is of the cause. So, uh, man was created in a state, as we've said, without passions, without needs, without corruption, without suffering, without death. Man was living according to nature, right? We often think of, we often say to ourselves, like, no, of course I sin. It's human nature. Well, yes, it's it's fallen human nature. But we, as fallen man, we are living below nature. We could say we are against nature. We're not living in a mode that is according to nature. Adam and Eve in paradise. That's the natural state of man. They were living according to nature. Now, Christ is even, Christ raises na human nature even above, like above nature, like super nature. Uh, so we fell from this kind of radiant mode according to nature, right? We were according to nature. We fell into mode below or against nature. And that brings with it uh, the fallen mode of reproduction, right? Everything about our life, everything about ourselves fell. Um, now we bring forth under the sway of the ancestral inheritance, which are the enemies, our, our enemies, sin and death, right? As we've said, um, it's just, it's inescapable. Uh, St. Maximus, the confessor says this, he says, when, however, he sinned by breaking God's commandment, he was condemned to birth based on sexual passion and sin. Sin henceforth constrained his true natural origin within the liability to passions that had accompanied the first sin, as though placing it under a new law. Accordingly, there is no human being who is sinless since everyone is naturally subject to the law of sexual procreation that was introduced after man's true creaturely origin in consequence of his sin. Okay, so again, let me emphasize that marriage and sexual relations are not sinful in and of themselves. That is not what being said here. But this sexual, this mode of reproduction is a post-fall reality, and it is how we pass on. Because it's the fallen mode of reproduction, it passes on the fallen mode of nature. Now, human nature is human nature. Adam and Eve before the fall, Adam and Eve after the fall, the incarnate Christ, uh, glorified in heaven. They all have the same nature. That What they have is a different mode of that nature, a condition of that nature, right? I'm generally healthy. If I were to get cancer... Uh, I'd become very sick, and yet it would be the same human nature, right? Adam and Eve were healthy, then they became sick. Christ makes us uh, incorrupt, super healthy, but it's all human nature, right? So that we're in now in a fallen mode. It's not a fallen. It's not a different nature. It's a fallen existence, a fallen character, a fallen mode of that same nature, and it brings with it the fallen mode of reproduction. 
Okay, so Eve was told that this is going to be painful, unfortunately. She heard about God's travail, childbirth, the pangs of childbirth. Um, but, you know, as we said, the mother of the Christian race, the new Eve, the most holy Theotokos, she heard rejoice. And the church teaches that she gave birth without, uh, without pain, painlessly. This is taught in the ecumenical councils. Uh, let me just check real quick. Uh, Canon 79 of the Council of Trullo and Trullo or the Quinisex Council. This is has ecumenical authority in the church. She's she gave birth without pain, and we can say she conceived it wasn't in the fallen mode, right? She didn't conceive by the normal way God came upon her, it was virginal, it was without pleasure. So it was without pain. It was she conceived not in the fallen way. So Christ did not receive the ancestral sin. The un fallen mode passes on fallen mode. Unfallen mode, non-fallen mode passes on non-fallen mode, right? We can even say she is the she is the, the garden is, of course, Eve is a uh, image of the mother of God. So is the garden. The mother of God is the virgin garden renewed and fulfilled, we can say. St. Hezekius, the priest, says the virginal vineyard was not tilled, referring to the mother of God. So she gave birth, but there wasn't, um, okay, although we know that Christ does die, we know that, but he laid down his life voluntarily. Behind, so behind her conception, there wasn't an imminent, necessary, lurking death like there is, uh, like Eve was told about, like what happens to all of us. Yes, Christ died, but voluntarily. Behind her conception... Uh, there was life, life with a big L, life itself. Um, and even when Christ dies, he does so in order to obviously trample down death by death. And on the cross, blood and water come out of his side. This is our new birth, water in the spirit, our new birth. This is the, you know, uh, our, our new birth through baptism is imaged forth even in and is caused by his death on the cross. So now, you know, a Christian mother, she bears a child. Uh, she no longer remembers, you know, the anguish of travail, as it says in the book of John. She, we now, we have a child, a mother bears a child. We bring him to the baptismal font. We bring him to, uh, the child has been given physical life. We now come to have him be reborn physically into this unfallen mode. We enter into Christ's unfallen mode mode of uh, conception and birth through the baptismal font, right? We're spiritually reborn. Uh, we bestow upon our child that birth from above. It's not passionate. There's no, no kind of fallenness involved. It's accomplished without pain, and it cleanses us of the curse, right? Uh, baptism is the beginning of our healing of the curse. Our fallen nature is regenerated. We're given all of the gifts that we need. We, uh, if we want it, well, we are restored to the Edenic, the paradisiacal, paradisiacal mode of being. We're united to life. We're united to Christ. He swallowed up death. Well, of course, it's up to us to continue in that. Uh, think about before baptism, what happens? You know, there's there's the exorcisms, right? This is important. In baptism, the church is expelling from the child the adversary of mankind. He's already at work within us. It's a, uh, you know, he's already at work, maybe not within us. He's already at work in the whole. Again, it's the if it's if the mode of reproduction is fallen, that's, you know, the adversary of mankind, as we say, is already at work there. Uh, so we say in the baptismal service, we cry out to God, look upon thy servant, prove him, and search him, and root out of him every operation of the devil. Rebuke the unclean spirits and expel them and purify the works of thy hands. We say to the serpent, to Satan himself, Wherefore I charge you, most crafty, impure, vile, loathsome, and alien spirit, by the might of Jesus Christ, who has all power, both in heaven and on earth, who said to the deaf and dumb demon, Come out of the man, and in no wise enter a second time unto him, depart. We, we, we proclaim to Satan, Be gone. Get out of here. This child is now Christ. We're, we're going to... Plunge him into the waters of new life. <clears throat> uh, 
So, you know, we brought forth in sorrow in the sense that it was painful that our child, we know there's lurking behind it, child. But we, when we bring our children to the baptismal font, we also therefore are hearing the Archangel Gabriel's annunciation, his proclamation, his exclamation, rejoice. Our child is born anew through the virgin waters. As I said, we are entered into Christ's unfallen mode of nature through the baptismal waters. For just, this is St. Macarius the Great, for just as pain and sorrow came upon Eve and all her offspring until now, so too does the joy of Mary come upon all her descendants. She heard rejoice. We enter into that rejoicing in the baptismal font, right? The virgin soil, you know, God created the new earth even before the curse. God made Adam out of the soil. He sprung forth unto new life. But as the wisdom of Solomon says, nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world, right? Adam was not meant to die. We are not meant to die. As we've been saying, we live outside the garden. Those of us who are beyond the walls of the garden, we spring forth from the womb already unto death. But in cleansing every new Christian in baptism, our mother, the church, uh, it's as if the, our mother, the church, is therefore announcing to our mothers, to all Christian mothers, it takes, it embraces mothers, covers them with its protective veil. The church is protective veil. It heals her of the devil's touch, which came upon her at the moment of the transmission of the ancestral death. That's the words of um, the Russian horror martyr, Daniel Sisov. He says that the church heals her of the devil's touch, which came upon her at the moment of the transmission of the ancestral death. Um, elsewhere, Father Daniel identifies this moment of the transmission. He says that is conception. The moment that the fallen mode of reproduction takes place, there's already ancestral sin there. There's already death there. Um, after following that, after mother gives birth, there's prayers. You know, we have prayers for all, you know, surrounding birth uh, for the several days after for the naming of the child. And then, of course, for baptism here, the church uh, prays on the first day after birth. Do thou thyself to God, do thou thyself have mercy upon this thy handmaid who today hath borne this child. Be gracious unto her voluntary and involuntary offenses. Protect her from every diabolical cruelty. Vouchsafe to her health, strength of soul and body and surround her with bright and shining angels and preserve her from every approach of invisible spirits. We, we appeal to God confident in his mercy, confident in the protection of his ministers. And, you know, eventually there's the, there's usually the period after birth where the mother and child, you know, they refrain from coming to church. They stay home, but then they come in their church and the new mother returns to the Holy Chalice. Uh, the church is again calling down the mercy of the Most High upon her, which alone prepares us for the body and blood. The mercy of God prepares us. Uh, we say, cleanse this thy handmaiden, her name, cleanse this thy handmaiden, Tatiana, whom thou hast saved by thy will, and who cometh into thy holy church from every sin and from every defilement, that she may be counted worthy to partake without condemnation of thy holy mysteries. This is from the prayers for a parturient woman after 40 days. So this is when the woman is returning to the church. You know, so with this prayer, the mother is like, she wasn't, of course, she wasn't outside the church in any way, but she's now numbered again among those who shall stand in the congregation who shall partake of the body and blood of Christ, which is the ultimate way, to, you know, our proclamation of our membership in the church and makes us the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ and we become the body of Christ ever more and more. She, the mother becomes the, one of those who shall stand in his holy place. In the words of the Psalm, receive a blessing from the Lord, mercy from God, their savior. You know, which, well, we, we pray that in, these are words that we pray in preparation for Holy Communion. We pray to be pure in heart, uh, but we also pray about having clean hands before Holy Communion, right? Body and soul go together. Everything we're talking about here is very, is both physical and spiritual. So, okay, so we hear today, the mother of God heard today, and we proclaim it. We enter into that reality. The archangels rejoice. And then uh, when we bring our own children to baptism, 
it's as if it's being proclaimed to us as well. In the archangels rejoice, we recognize our deliverance from the curse, right? Eve heard of pain and childbearing and death, suffering. We here rejoice. The curse is undone. We're delivered from the hand of Satan. With this archangel's cry of rejoice, we recognize our salvation, of which today is the beginning. As we said, the Troparian says today is the beginning of our salvation, because today is really when Christ enters creation. So, O Theotokos and Virgin, rejoice, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, for thou hast borne Christ the Savior, the deliverer of our souls. 